It is now Tuesday morning. The disciples point to the withered fig tree that Jesus had cursed the day before. Jesus gives his disciple a simple lesson from it. Have faith in God. In particular, he says, if they have undoubting faith, they can throw even the mountains into the sea. Now, if the disciples had ears to hear, they would recognize that Jesus is talking about more than seemingly magical powers that can curse trees and crumble mountains. He is talking about realities bigger than this. Note that he closes this mini lesson on mountain moving, undoubting faith, by saying, whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. Jesus is reminding us that failing to forgive looms as a bigger obstacle to answered prayer than a mountain. The disciples will soon face great challenges to their faith and their ability to forgive. Will they remember the withered tree on the road to Bethany? As they approached the holy city, Jerusalem, the events from the day before could not have been far from their minds. As Jesus enters the temple mount, crowds gather to hear him teach. And the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders waste no time in making their move. They will try to lay four traps to catch Jesus. Trap number one, by whose authority they demanded to know had Jesus carried out his actions the day before. Jesus doesn't take the bait. Instead, he turns the tables on them with a question, one of his own. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? If they respond from heaven, the next question is obvious then why don't you believe the one about whom John testifies? If they retort from man, they risk alienating the crowds that hold John in high esteem as a prophet. Jesus then offers three parables uh, that all point and drive home the idea that they are rejecting grace and truth in the service of their hypocritical self-righteousness. Trap number two. Whose allegiance? The leaders try a new tactic. They send Pharisees and Herodians to ask him a question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? If Jesus answers yes, he shatters people's expectations of him as the Messiah who will overthrow this Roman rule. If he says no, he can be arrested for fomenting revolt. But Jesus deftly evades the either old dilemma. The denarius has Caesar's image on it. And as long as Caesar is in power, it is appropriate to pay taxes to him. And we are also to give God the things that are of God's. Since we are made in God's image, we owe God everything. All that we have and all that we are to him. So pay your taxes and worship God. Trap number three. Whose wife in the resurrection? After Jesus has silenced the Pharisees and Sadducees, tried to ridicule Jesus' belief in the resurrection by asking a trick question about marriage in heaven. Jesus tells them that they do not understand scripture or the power of God. God himself shows that he is God of the living and not just the dead. Like the others, their smirk turns into marvel as they grow silent. And trap number four, Now the Pharisees send forth an expert in the law to question Jesus. Which of God's commands is the greatest? Jesus summarizes his answer in one word. Love. To love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor. But Jesus discerns something different about this person asking the question. So he encourages him and invites him in by saying, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But now it's Jesus' turn to initiate some questions with those who are trying to trap him. When he asked them a question about Psalm 110, verse 1, and how the Messiah can be David's Lord, no one was able to answer him with word. Nor, from that day forward, did anyone dare to ask Jesus any more questions. Jesus then launches a lengthy, scathing critique of the scribes and Pharisees, pronouncing seven woes of judgment upon these hypocrites and blind guides. 
The full-scale verbal assault removes all doubt concerning Jesus' intentions, agendas, and aims. He has no desire to ally himself with the current leadership. He has come to overthrow their authority. There's no way both sides can survive the escalating conflict. Either Jesus will assume power or he will die. With another tension-filled day behind them, Jesus and his disciples begin to head back to Bethany. They stop on the Mount of Olives to rest, giving them a wonderful view of Jerusalem as the sun sets. The disciples marvel at the size and the grandeur of these impressive buildings. But Jesus tells them that a day is coming soon when not a single stone will be left upon another. And he goes on to explain that his followers will experience increasing persecution and tribulation leading up to the final day of judgment. But their task is to remain vigilant and persist in faith. So Tuesday is now done, but Friday is coming. This is not the flannel board Jesus some of us learned about as a child. This is the real historical Jesus fully in control as he responds with grace and truth to, tr to, to the traps on all sides. He knows that he is what he is doing, and he knows what is coming. Every word, every step is for the fame of his Father's name and the salvation of those willing to pick up their cross and die with him.